Hello Larry, my name is Jaburi Khazou um, from ETH Zurich. I'm very pleased to meet you, I know nice a lot about you. your work. Nice um, I should you. introduce you, Larry Gilbert from yeah. uh, University of Texas at Austin and right. director of the Brackenridge Laboratory, Field Laboratory. Brackenridge Field Laboratory, Laboratory yes. Um, obviously I'm very familiar with your work on butterflies, fascinating work. Thank you. Um, maybe we can start by asking you what, what really inspired you to get involved in tropical ecology and, and then later on butterflies. Right. Well. Um, I, I'm a native Texan and I, my family colonized Texas when it was a state of Mexico in 1827. And so my family was uh, along the Mexican border. So I grew up helping my grandfather with, with his bee business and, there, and there had some small ranching and things. So I was out in nature in an area we could call the intemperate zone. Uh, it's not really temperate, it's not really tropical. It's a pretty rough place, but I was collecting everything, insects and arrowheads from Indians and all these things. And, but occasionally, particularly in December, there would be butterflies coming in that were exotic. So I would be getting these tropical Mexican butterflies, like mycelia and things like this, coming out of nowhere. And I had notebooks, and these were magic things. I go, well, where in the heck are these coming from? And so, uh, slowly but surely, I was going through the process of being interested in butterflies and their host plants and so forth. But when I got old enough to be independent, I rounded up uh, some, a couple of friends as undergraduates and we drove to Mexico with me guiding them to uh, to tropical parts of Tamaulipas. Uh, and they were my hapless uh, helpers. And I go down there and find morpho butterflies and all these things. Um, and so that was the you know, the first introduction. And then in 1965, I took a course at the University of Texas by a geographer on the transition between the tropics and the temperate zone in, across northern, northeastern Mexico. And in, um, and in that course, I wrote a paper on the biogeographical realms from the viewpoint of butterflies. And at that time, it was considered to be 20 degrees north in Veracruz, where the tropical fauna dropped off. But I'd been studying also in this course a monograph by Paul Martin on the herps and reptiles of the Gomez Frias area, which had vegetation zones and so forth. And from that, I developed predictions of what butterflies would be there. So I got an NSF grant as an undergraduate. They did this before the Vietnam War took out our budget. And uh, so the summer of 65, I'd go by myself to Tamaulipas and walk around in the mountains for two months collecting butterflies. Uh, back when OTS was just getting started. But of course, for the most part, I didn't know what in the heck I was looking at. Well, in that same course, there was a man named Craig Nelson, who was a graduate student of Frank Blair, who later was a professor at Indiana. He's now deceased. And he was a herpetologist. He was the one that put me onto the Martin monograph. And he was also the one that told me about OTS. And so I applied to OTS um, before I was a graduate student and was admitted in 66 for the summer fundamentals course in 66, where I encountered the cast of characters we see here. Uh, Rob Caldwell was another one of the students. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, Steve Arnold was one of the students. Uh, Dan Jansen was a, a, a faculty member. Doug Fatuma was a faculty member. So there was, it was, uh, a guy who had not been to graduate school with 24 TAs, all senior, more senior graduate students from places like Michigan, and, uh, and these amazing people who have uh, carved the field uh, ever since. It strikes me that you had a real sense of adventure when you were young and as an undergraduate. Do you think there are still the opportunities these days for young scientists now to engage in the same kind of adventurous exploration? Seems like they more want to adventure in uh, barcoding and, and in alignments of DNA at a computer. And I, and I would like to get them off their duffs into the field more and somehow balance that. And that's one reason I've emphasized the field station in Austin and doing field courses right there within our, within our city so that we can get people off their computers and into the field locally at an early stage because they do say wow I wish I'd known about this you know earlier but they don't grow up as rural kids like I did I think if you talk to Dan Jansen you'll find out his dad was a you know in wildlife and he was in the field and he went to Mexico with his family and collected butterflies as a kid so you know it's 
that childhood experience is really important. And I, uh, when I evaluate graduate students for accepting graduate students, I always say, what, are you, what were your passions as a kid? And the ones that have been, I think, most successful were already doing it as kids. Um, it's hard to stick, it's hard to get into it later, but you can do it, but. And you, you mentioned the OTS. Right. That was clearly a formative experience yes, in your life. Tell me a little bit about some yes. of the first OTS trips you went on. Well, I think, the, I think the important thing for me was I already was thinking about these things and wondering about these things from my own personal exploration. And this is what put it all together. So I had people who, could, who knew some things about the details I was already wondering about. Uh, the young Dan Chanson was, as he is now, phenomenal, and he was very influential. And what he was, but his main influence, as far as looking back, his main influence was, it's okay to do natural history. Because at that point, we were coming up in a system where everybody was supposed to be another Robert MacArthur, right? And this guy was giving talks in which he was spouting off speculation as if it was out of the Bible. He was giving numbers and figures and stuff that he was just coming out of his head from his experience. And it was very believable and a lot of it is true. But the main thing was that he was inspiring us. Um, and um, I thought about being his graduate student actually. Um, Doug Fatuma was absolutely inspirational to me. He gave a series of lectures in this course and my, I have the book with me we had 55 lectures. Doug gave a series of about six lectures entitled Evolution in the Tropics. And he was, he had worked with uh, uh, Lewinton and Levins, and he was bubbling around trying to think of how to merge ecology and evolution when Levins was just trying to do it in, the, in his monograph, his Princeton monograph. And so there I was, never having had an evolution course. I'd had genetics, I'd had ecology, but here's a guy merging the tropical diversity with trying to interpret it from the standpoint of ecology and evolution. And, th and that was very inspirational. Um, and I still have thoughts from that that, you know, uh, that help guide. So uh, it was the contact with nature and, and it was also, as it is in graduate school, the contact with all the other uh, graduate students who are, who are uh, diverse and, and intelligent and interesting. Can you give me some memorable stories or good memories you have from, from that time? Well, it, you know, uh, when we went to the, one of our, uh, well, let me do some humorous ones. So the first place we went was Toboga, which was the Hagnauer and the Hagnauer properties in Guanacaste. And, um, so we went out on the Rio Toboga, and one of the first thing, one of the first field problems that we did, we were going to mist net some bats. So we set up a mist net on a creek bottom, and I helped get it set up. And we were just finishing, and here comes a cow. And oh hell, here comes the cow. It's going to hit it right for the mist net. So I would worked with cows all my life. So I said, okay, let's let's get this old cow out of the way. So. I said, all right, let's spread out and charge it and run it back the other way. So we got up front and we started charging the cow and it, it must have had a calf on the other side of the mist net because this thing just runs through the line and goes right through the mist net. We never saw the mist net again. Anyway, so we caught a cow, but we didn't catch the mist net. <laughs> um, when we, um, then we flew into the uh, Osa and at that time, of course, there were no roads. Uh, it was almost totally forested except for, I guess at that point in 66, they were just beginning to clear the Corcovado area. Uh, but that was a real mystery on the other side of the mountains to us. And uh, so we were in a, flew into the uh, uh, Osa Productus Forestalis site and Holridge and, and those guys had a field station there um, that the Tropical Science Center operated in the forestry sector. And so it was a very small building and so forth. And I have a, actually a picture of Dan Jansen sweeping the, the stairway of that building after, as we were packing up to leave. Um, so I haven't had a chance to get him back for pictures he shows me, but anyway. Um, but the courses at that time, there was no thought of there's a limitation on primary forest. 
or that we have to worry about organisms that we kill or whatever. And so we had this term that we call otzing the forest, which is the, you'd have a field problem group and they'd say, okay, we're gonna take um, you know, a, an eighth of a hectare or whatever it is, and we're gonna get rakes and we're gonna rake up all the litter, put it in bags and kill everything and then count all the stuff. You know, how many terciopalas do we have? How many lizards, how many this, how many that? And so that was sort of a standard thing. And Jansen was running sweep net projects where you'd sweep up 20,000 insects, as he tends to do. And, uh, and then we'd try to make sense of the patterns. So instead of parataxonomists, he had OTS students uh, doing these massive data collecting things. Um, one, thing that, one thing I really remember is that there was a field problem on uh, vine ecology. And the idea was how fast did vines transpire? And so we would get a five gallon bucket full of water. Somebody would walk up to a liana this big, go whack and we'd stick it in the bucket and see how fast it sucks the water out. It's damn fast. And then we, okay, we wrote down the data, but we just killed a liana that will never recover, you know, because it's now down trying to root back in the shadows. So it was a different, it was a very different time. And we had two courses going that summer. Um, one of them that I was in was a collapsed advanced course that was supposed to be vertebrate biology. So I was in with more advanced graduate students. The other course, which Mildred Mathias was with, and I remember Doug Gill was a student in that one, a few others, uh, Gary Stiles, I think. Um, they were running separately, and so we were jumping around from place to place. Uh, we had a, another guy with us who was quite remarkable. He was a Jay Savage student named Norm Scott who was a famous herpetologist who was famous for having his hand bitten so many times by, by caimans and his fingers taken off by being bitten by rattlesnakes and whatever. And he had all these amputations and scars and whatever. And so these guys go out and are collecting the biggest, it's the uh, avoid herpetologists at all costs. You, they were collecting all this stuff. And so there are two things. We had the, uh, we would have an organism lab which we would bring in all the organisms that everybody could collect, plants, animals, whatever. And we would have a session and they would put everything on the tables and everybody that could identify something would label it. Some of the students were good at this and some of the faculty. And then we'd go around plants, insects, herps, whatever. And we had some live snakes this one particular day. And, um, and I remember Doug Fatuma was interested in learning how to key out herps. And so he picks up a snake which had been declared a non-toxic mimic, I believe, and it had been handled by all the herpetologists, and in fact, everybody in the class, and Doug was the last one, and he was practicing his key, key technique. So he's sitting there with a, a key, and he's on a, a wooden chair and kind of in the middle of the room, and he's counting the scales on this snake, and suddenly, everybody's, nobody's paying attention to Doug, and suddenly he says, Jesus Christ! <laughs> and he throws this snake out into the room and falls over backwards in the chair. And it was not what everybody thought it was. It was a, it was a, a toxic rear fang snake that was probably not too pleasant to, to have biting you. Uh, and we knew the other course was coming in. And so uh, as we left, we left a six foot caiman in the shower, locked in the shower for them to find one. So anyway, it was, it was pretty wild. And what was the inspiration? I mean, I've seen some of your notebooks, and maybe yeah. we'll have a chance to see those later yeah. on. You obviously put in a huge amount of effort and detail and attention to detail. Yes. But what inspired you to do that? Did you have a, a, a sense of um, you were wanting to find something out about science or, or conservation, or was it your own curiosity? No, it was, a, it was star I was still kind of in the 19th century explorer phase. Okay. You know, you, you encounter these things and you try mm. to learn about them and mm. I was not a fish person, I was not a herb person. I was a botany, I did do botany because I was interested in, in as an undergraduate, because um, I was interested in butterflies primarily and, and I hung all the plant taxonomy onto butterfly host plant groups, that's how I organized my plants. But I really felt the importance of, of learning plants. Uh, but um, I was always into interactions, I worked with my granddad who was a beekeeper and and the attitude about the importance of different shrubs in the mesquite grasslands and so forth, that was already, already kind of embedded. And we were having to burn the thorns off the prickly pear in the droughts to, so the cows wouldn't have all these thorns in their mouths and be injured by the cactus. So there was obviously, yeah, I remember one time saying, well, 
there that he was growing in the garden a, a, a spineless form of a puntia. I said, well, and this is a guy with no education, right? I said, well, why, why don't we just plant this for the cows? He said, that's stupid. <laughs> the cows would just eat it. And then there wouldn't be any when there's a drought. I said, of course, you know, there's a defensive thing. So, so I look back and I see that, you know, social insects and animal plant interactions, all that was kind of out of just the way people lived in, uh, in the countryside. And they, they kind of understood these intuitively. And surely all the, the, the campesinos understand all this stuff too. And the Indians, uh, the Amerindians before them. So. In your notebooks, you've got beautiful drawings, you've got detailed yeah, yeah. notes. Um, and yet yeah, Dan Jansen was um, promoting the idea that nature can be very accessible now through iPhones and modern technology. Yeah. And he showed a slide of kids with their iPhones taking yeah, yeah. photographs. Um, to what extent do you think that's a good thing as opposed to a bad thing because perhaps these kids are not spending so much time in terms of drawing and, and looking at the Oh, I think it's a good thing. I'm totally into it. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have my field ecology class, which I teach for undergraduates. I kind of modeled it on my graduate course that I used to run down here. And, uh, and I, I have a handout called uh, Smartphone Ecology, in which all the apps that I think are really useful, like the GPS apps and... Um, uh, various kinds of phot photography apps that help them in uh, geo-referencing, all that kind of stuff, and some of the identification material. Uh, and, and, and just being able to take a clear photograph of something and then have notes that you can put associated with a photograph and have the location, it's fantastic. And, and you don't have to really, particularly in a small reserve like we have, you can't afford to collect anything, everything anymore when you have hundreds of students going through. So instead of pen specimens, you have a clear photograph, which is very easy to identify. Very few plants in flower, take a picture of the flower, and let's don't collect it. So it's a different time. But if I can push you on that a little bit, yeah. um, you clearly learned a lot by looking in sure. detail at the, at the organisms because you had yeah, to to do the right. drawings. That's right. But that step seems to be missing. Is, is, do you view that as a problem or not really? Well, I was, I'd, I'd sketch things carefully uh, in order to, I would do that to key them out. Particularly if I, if I collected something and I would sketch the, say, the parts of the flower. And now I could later not have the specimen and I could run the key just from my sketch. So that is a good, uh, good habit to have. It makes you look at it in more detail. But you can also section a flower and take a close-up macro picture of it and do the same thing. So, and you're saving some time. Not everybody can draw as well as I can do. I, I had kind of a native talent in that. So not everybody can render a, a line drawing that's going to end on the spot and then be use, have that useful. So I don't know. It depends on the person. So after this early formative period, you right. started getting involved in research with butterflies, particularly looking at mimetic rings and so on. Um, what steered you in that direction as opposed to some other direction? Um, well, when, um, so as a young kid, I was, uh, my dad moved around a lot. He was a minister. And my parents both uh, tolerated my interest in natural history because I was studying the handiwork of God. This is how we often get started. And uh, we were in a lot of different places including the, the Hawaiian archipelago when he was stationed on Midway. I was nine years old. That was a very formative thing. And I was planning to be a marine. I was interested in molluscan color patterns, things like conus patterns. Um, and, uh, and, and we moved back to the coast of Texas. And um, there are tall tar balls washing in. It's muddy. It's ugly. And it wasn't like being on a mid-Pacific atoll anymore. And I found a caterpillar out in the, behind, by the uh, Papileo polixenes on a native umbilifer. And my mother said, well, here's a Coke bottle. Put the plant in there and put it in the window and close the window. And so I, had, I watched the caterpillar develop. So I was, you know, in 1951, I was raising caterpillars. And ever, ever after that, I was raising butterflies. And gradually, the other, I was shooting birds with a 410 and trying to be John James Ottoman, making scuddy skins. I was doing everything. And gradually, and I think you talked to a lot of people, and they were collecting all sorts of natural, they were a natural history museum in their bedroom, and they gradually, it goes back to something uh, that's accessible and that they find aesthetically pleasing. And to me, the, both the plant and the insect side of it were of interest from the very start. Heliconius 
comes from some reverse psychology, I think. Uh, we went, we would go on family trips. I was the oldest, there were four siblings. We would go, uh, very go, often go to uh, state parks and things, and I was always have an insect net and collect things. So we go to the, something called the Sunken Garden in San Antonio. And there I saw my first Heliconius. It was Heliconius cheritonia. I had no idea anything that beautiful existed. And when I went to collect it, my father forbid me from collecting this butterfly because we're in a public place. And so I showed him. The natural history is clearly very important as yes, well, right. something you mentioned several right, times right. now. Um, to what extent do you think there has been a decline in our attention to natural history across the, the scientific uh, arena? Yeah, I think. And to what extent is, is that a cost to society? Yeah, I think that it's a, um, uh, I think it's, I, I think it is a uh, problem that this has declined and it has to do with what is emphasized now in modern science. Um, all science starts with observing pattern and observing things that raise questions in your head. And you can't do that. You, you can do that with meta-analysis of other people's data, and that's what people are mainly doing now. But you don't see the really new novel stuff that way because you don't know how people collected their data. You have to trust it. And so to go out and actually see an interaction nobody had seen before, and that makes you think about all the networks and the interactions that are going on. That, that was particularly uh, accessible with Heliconius. And I actually started on another group of butterflies, the Ethomiine butterflies, and their, my OTS report in the advanced course I took was on that group. Other people picked up after that, but I abandoned it when I found that I could never recover them in the field after marking them. Um, I marked thousands and would get two recaptures. Whereas Heliconius, when I wrote numbers on them, I would recover them in their same little area. And also, when I brought them into a greenhouse, I could raise them in a greenhouse and study all their interactions in a greenhouse. And Darwin did similar things, not that I'm like Darwin, but he got a lot out of just sitting at his house working on orchids in a greenhouse. So I think it's important to have uh, contact with the interactions that you can observe in an experimental setting at, at odd densities where you might see, you can always see something because the interactions are so dense and then ask yourself, is that just a artifact of being in an enclosure or is it something in the field? And mostly the things I found in a greenhouse turned out to be in the field or just hard to see. And vice versa, you see something you're suspicious about in the field, come back to the greenhouse or come back to a, a sample area. So what role do you think OTS and ATBC have to promote the idea of natural history among the younger scientists today? Well, I think, I mean, certainly the role is to bring people into contact with these wonderful sites. Um, I think some of the magic of the old courses are lost simply because we know so much more now. And, uh, and it does seem to the incoming generations that everything is known. And that's absolutely not true. It's just that people forming the hypotheses were the pioneers that went out and looked and found some systems that were low-hanging fruit. Now the systems to, to do the natural history on are a little bit harder to perceive. Maybe you need different tools or just a different brain looking at it. It's still out there. I think we've gotten away a little bit from that. And I would like to see more straight, exploratory, organismally-based courses and rather than spending all your time learning analysis of variants in the field. I'd like to see a little bit more of the old flavor. And, um, and, and so the role would be to re-examine how much that kind of natural history uh, exploration can be done in the context of modern scientific questions. So, so I'd like to ask you two questions yeah. uh, and then move on to, maybe you could show us your notebooks. Sure. Um, the first question is regarding your work on uh, Heliconia and the speciation events that was widely publicized recently. Yeah. Um, to what extent can we afford to do that kind of research when there are so many other priorities in terms of conservation and action and management? Uh, it may be argued that that kind of thing is a, is a luxury in this day and age. How would you I respond agree. to that? I agree with that, but I, I do think we need to understand some systems very deeply. And, and a, that system turns out to be a good model system for understanding everything from molecular level of Evo Devo up to behavior and up to community interactions. 
So it is kind of a model system for diversification. So I, I think it's fine to have some systems that, that are accessible, that are good to bring in the lab, can be worked on in the field. And it just turns out to be, I mean, the reasons I selected it turn out to be the reasons it's turned, accidentally, of course, but it turns out that's why it's a, a really nice model system. And it's beautiful, it attracts people. So I, I, it's a non-trivial thing. It's not a trivial luxury. It's actually informing us of a lot of things that seem to be special to Heliconius. But then when you look at it, you just see, well, that is not that special. It's just harder to see in other things, okay? So I think it's, as a model system, that informs you about how, I think, for example, hybrid speciation is gonna be widespread in insects. And we already know about it in plants. Heliconius just makes it easier to perceive. And, and I would say, I would extend that to my general argument for that kind of thing. The second question following on the yeah. same theme of that particular study. Given that there seems to be a lot of evidence now for incipient speciation, um, hybrid speciation right. through hybridization yeah. and so on, do you think we ever are, will ever be able to fully catalog the life on planet Earth? No, but it's fun to do it. <laughs> I, mean, I, 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 I'm, I would have to say that um, a careful sampling or a careful strategy of that and not just a blind, let's sample everything is what you'd want to do and, and be selective about what your groups are and there are going to be some groups like bacteria where that could just be the, the resources on the planet are not going to allow that. So it has to be a thoughtful process where you're selecting the groups that are going to inform you the most about the general application of ideas you would get. So you would want to, you know, take things that allow you to say, how do we conserve tro the tropical diversity? Well, I wrote about that in 1978. It was published in 1980 on the, in the first conservation biology book, applying the Heliconius food web ideas to conserving diversity in general. And it was very much that tactic of, let's take a, a, a food web that we can understand that may reflect lots of other diversity out there. And let's apply that to our strategies. And, and uh, you can argue, you can argue, well, that's too narrow, but maybe just conserving jaguars is the way to keep everything going. And there's a good argument for that. But uh, we're not always there with jaguars anymore.